Welcome to the intermediary level topic area of EPFL's online data science course program. We will be focusing on the data visualization aspect. For the registered learners on the course, please have some writing material with you now so you could actively follow the lesson, writing down the key points and your thoughts down. You are invited to further your learning by participating in posting and sharing your discourse on Verso's online classroom communicated to you. Please pause the video if necessary to access to the writing materials. We'll be focusing on learning this domain, the data visualization as part of data science. This data science course of EPFL covers eight key subject matter expertises, these being the advanced computing area, visualization, the hacker mindset, the domain expertise, data engineering, the scientific method, the mathematics and the statistics areas. We'll be focusing on learning the data visualization as part of data science. At the end of this lesson, you would have learned the 4W1H of data visualization. The what, the why, the when, the where, and the how. This lesson structure will be adhered to. Building on the newly acquired 4W1H data visualization expertise, You'll apply these by performing critiques of some of today's applications of data visualization as supplied in today's dashboards, web pages of infographics, and animated infographics. You'll quickly explore the future of three-dimensional visualization and augmented learning. More learning resources and references are provided for your deeper learning. There's a quiz to help you reaffirm, recall, and retain your learning of data visualization. And why not take your learning further by creating your very own dashboard and or animated infographic. I start you with a simple exercise. Here, we have a list of three-digit random numbers which could well represent a set of data of a data variable such as the number of telephone room reservations and queries received by the hotels in a small Swiss village over a period of 20 days. As a data scientist, you have been asked to perform data analysis of this raw data and of course report and present your findings. Are you thinking of a one-page text report of your observations analysis and conclusions? Assuming you want to start the analysis with finding the simple minimum and maximum values. Well, what are your answers? What is more important to the answers is the process and the time you have taken to process the information. As your eyes scan down the list of numbers, as your mind updates the maximum and the minimum buckets in your mind, assuming you could do them both at the same time, or if you have strategically used the elimination approach by scanning for the 100 and 900 series of numbers, you have but to process the raw data somehow in your mind. That takes time, effort, and resources. Sure, there will be some of you who are more tech savvy who would have used the minimum and the maximum functions. Imagine when the data set is not 20 but big. Now, if we take the same list or set of raw data and produce a visual view of it, like with a line graph. Now, using the line graph, how would you arrive at the minimum and the maximum value? In contrast with the previous exercise, in terms of the time taken to find the answer, has it been quicker? In terms of the computational thought processing, what would you say? Much simpler? 
you will see that data visualization is built on the principle of pre-attentiveness that you will learn much later. And that data visualization facilitates other forms of thought processing less complex, freeing the mind the clinician to do other computational analysis work with the data. If we have taken the same list or set of raw data and produced this visual view of it with the form of a pie chart instead of a line graph, now looking at a pie chart, how would you pick out the minimum and the maximum value? In contrast with the previous exercise with the line graph, in terms of time taken to find the answers, have it been slower? In terms of computational thought processing, what would you say? More complex, as you have to gauge the portions, dimensions, compare the size, and accurately remember the reference to come to a decision? What is your critique on the choice of the graph used? This exercise presents yet another principle of data visualization at work, a principle laid down by Burton in 1983, which would be further elaborated in this lesson. Burton elaborates on the graphical vocabulary of visual components and its proper combination to make powerful visual views. Here is a simple example of the visualization of two data variables, productivity as per recognized revenue per employee using a thousand scale and the increasing number of employees as company grows. What are the insights or information you could derive from the correlation of these two variables? That the productivity of a company drops as it increases its employee space with more headcount? At a rate of 17% for every additional 500 employees? What else? Your learning this far should help you make sense of these definitions of data visualization. That it is information that has been abstracted in some schematic form, including attributes or variables for the units of information. That data visualization is viewed by many disciplines as the modern equivalent of visual communication. Data visualization is a general term that describes any effort to help people understand the significance of data by placing it in a visual context patterns, trends, and correlations that might go undetected in text-based data can be exposed and recognized easier with data visualization software. Let's examine Treisman's first principle of pre-attentiveness. In this exercise, you are to spot the unique piece of data. You know, the game show of spotting the one of these things doesn't belong together. Look at figure A. You can instantly spot the unique piece of data regardless of how many more thousands or millions of blue dots there would be. You can pre-attentively recognize differences in color. Look at figure B. You have had more trouble spotting the unique data because you cannot pre-attentively recognize Simultaneous variation of color and form. Treisman refers pre-attentiveness as the visual properties that a person can perceive in fewer than 250 milliseconds without having to scan the visual view serially, since eye movement and focus take about 200 milliseconds. Pre-attentive observations take the same amount of time regardless of the number of objects being viewed. For example, people can accurately determine whether or not one red circle is presented among a field of blue circles in fewer than 200 seconds, like in the figure A. However, 
determining the number of items with the alternative color is not pre-attentive. It requires a serial scan of all the objects to do the counting. Combinations of properties are also usually not pre-attentive. Although people can detect one square among many circles of the same color, because of the angular corners of the square are pre-attentively differentiated from the curves of the circles, the eye cannot detect the combination of the color distinction and the shape distinction simultaneously. This requires serial scanning as you have found out yourself in the figure piece. Attentiveness explains why a small amount of color highlighting against a white page is so effective at drawing the attention. A notable successful use of visual cues in search interfaces search engines is color highlighting of query terms in documents and bolding of query terms in document summaries in retrieval results. However, if there are many colors in a display, color highlighting does not work well at drawing attention. Note that not all cues in a visualization need to be pre-attentive to be useful. Rather, it is important to know which visual components cause a pre-attentive reaction in order to know what will stand out in a display. We move on now to another principle, that of the graphical vocabulary of visual components by Burton. We will take a look at Gestalt principles of proximity. In summary, you have just learned these key principles in EPFL's data science data visualization course. The principle of pre-attentiveness elaborates on the visual properties that allow a person to perceive in less than 250 milliseconds and that combinations of properties are usually not pre-attentive. Burton's principle surrounds the graphical vocabulary of marks such as points, marks and areas, of retinal variables of color, size, shape, orientation and scale, and how important the proper combination of graphical vocabulary lends to data visualization. Last but not least, Gestalt principles of proximity is about visually representing the affiliation and the affinity of data. There's a whole realm of subject material out there in this globally connected world. As Whitehead has said, knowledge does not keep any better than fish. Academics, researchers and practitioners would continue to work and develop on data visualization as technology evolves. We are lifelong learners, so there will be new principles to be learned. Data is not restricted just to numbers. Text is also data. Imagine the doors of the restrooms of international airports receiving travelers from all over the world. Imagine these doors having to be signed male or female in the many different languages. No, they have been replaced by visuals that are now universally accepted iconic representations of the text of the meaning in the many different languages of the world. Here is a visual graphic of the results of Stanford's dissertation browser on the dissertation topic distance between chemistry and all the other departments in 2008. The area of the circles denotes the number of dissertations. Those faded out circles represent the departments without published dissertations in 2008. Scanning the text of the dissertation topics and performing lexical analysis, this visual shows us the results in answer to the goal. Which department 
produces the biggest number of published dissertations in 2008. The biggest blue circle of electrical engineering departments. Why are there different colors of circles used? To group black departments similar disciplines. Example, red circles for languages such as German and Italian and blue circles for technical engineering subjects such as computer engineering and electrical engineering. Other than the closest similar color green circle of the black physics, which non-green department is the closest in terms of topic to the chemistry department? The little blue material engineering. And an often encountered academic text analyzer is the anti-plagiarism software tool used by institutions to check for plagiarized work. There should be interesting data visuals on plagiarized work out there. Here we have a lexical text data visualization of the commentary on the internet about the US operation that led to the killing of Osama bin Laden. The cloud on the left was developed at Opinions. The cloud on the right is a Twitter search for the term Osama bin Laden. Judging by the occurrence of the word, what sense could you make out of the public opinion on opinion and over Twitter? Having better understood the world of data and text data visualization, we enter the world of infographics, which is born from blending these two together. Listed here are some principles, some guidelines, and some practices on infographics supporting the use of visual graphics. If there's a picture that can convey the same message of a block of lexical text communication, use it. A good visual exploits the use of intuitive paradigms, bias, and standards. It takes one-tenth of a second for a viewer to get a sense of the message. As a visual optimized, there is the presence of some statistics to be communicated. An infographic optimizes the use of color, font, bold, form, and dimension of the visual component. It is optimized for less information is better, or the more, the bigger, the better. An infographic should have minimal text to economize. Having better understood the world of data and text data visualization, we enter the world of infographics, which is born from blending these two together. Listed here are some principles, some guidelines, and best practices on infographics supporting the use of visual graphics. If there's a picture that can convey the same message of a block of lexical text communication, use it. A good visual exploits the use of intuitive paradigms, bias, and standards. It takes one-tenth of a second for a viewer to get the sense of the message. A visual optimized, there is the presence of some statistics to be communicated. An infographic optimizes the use of color, font, bold, form, and dimension of the visual component. It is optimized for less info is better, or the more, the bigger, the better. An infographic should have minimal text to economize on translation resources and to reach a wider audience as it removes the language barriers. Last but not least, a good graphic usually has an amazing headline. Now, let us take some time to apply the learning of data visualization by performing a critique on this infographic. What do you think? of the amazing headline. How has free attentiveness been exploited here? Comment on the graphic vocabulary of the visual components.
which visual component, if any, communicate that this infographic is about the high net worth of an individual? What visual component would you use to signify money, to replace the circles? How would you judge the extent of optimization of the retinal variables of color, font, form, bold, and scale used here? What kind of enhancement would you introduce to this infographic? Why? Similarly, take the time to apply your learning lessons by performing a critique on these two dashboards. Which one would you rather view every day? Why? Pause the video if necessary so you could observe and reflect on your thoughts and learning here. Let's take a glimpse into the future of data visualization by watching an excellent YouTube video by BBC Channel 4 of Professor Hans Rosling's data visualization work on health data and income data of 200 countries over 200 years made possible from the data science of Big Data and Hadoop. He is a Swedish medical doctor, academic, statistician and public speaker. He is a professor of international health at Karolinska Institute and co-founder and chairman of the Gapminder Foundation which developed the Trend Analyzer software system. He rose to international acclaim after producing a TED talk in which he promoted the use of data to explore development issues. Observe how Professor Hans Rosling unravels the correlation between the quantitative variable of wealth income and the ordinary time variable and injecting his insights and many other relevant variables of historical and economic events. Following his video is this one minute video presenting the use of a three dimensional paint tool called the Tilt Brush by Google. The future of data visualization will be in the use of such three dimensional visual technology to augment data visualization to solve problems. Imagine Professor Hans Rosling's data visualizations work of 200 years, 200 countries, but presented in three dimensions. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space, with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person. 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! 
And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Having seen the future of data visualization world of the data scientist, please perform the below quiz to evaluate your understanding and learning of today's topic on data visualization. Even if you have scored well, it would be good to repeat the quiz intentionally providing the wrong answers to further check your learning with the correct responses. And here is the Verso app class where you could further share and discuss your notes, observations, thoughts, actions, readings, learning resources, and critics of your own learning on this topic with your peers. Take it further by liking each other's posting. On this slide, you'll find the references to the teaching material used in this lesson. 
And here are more resources for your further learning. To well complete today's lesson on data visualization, why not apply your learning by creating your very own animated infographic and or dashboard. The next and the last video gives you an idea with the biteable URL address to access to the technology to create an animated infographic in about five minutes. Post it to Verso and further deepen your learning on data visualization. If you would but observe the communication around you from today, I am sure you can better understand and appreciate data visualization. Thank you for your attention and have a great visual day.